Now, one of the ways that we cope when children are traumatized, one of the ways they, they cope with it is to soothe themselves, and then that's where addictions come in. But another way to cope would be is if you get the message that you're not good enough, that you are not worthy enough, then you might spend the rest of your life trying to prove that you are. And how do you do that? By being very nice to everybody. By never saying how you feel, because they might not like how you feel. Many of us struggle with deep-rooted issues that we can't seem to overcome. This pain affects our relationships, our work, and our overall well-being. In today's video, Dr. Gabor Mate will explore why trauma hurts us so deeply and offer his guide to healing. Stay with us to uncover a powerful revelation that could change the way you understand your past and heal your present. I've found Dr. Matei's work incredibly insightful in my own journey. His perspective on trauma has helped me understand the deeper layers of my own experiences and those of people around me. Addressing trauma is not just about healing past wounds. It's about transforming our lives and relationships. Dr. Matei's approach offers a compassionate and comprehensive way to understand and address these deep-seated issues. Honored to be here, and especially um, I'll be quoting this morning from A.H. Almas or Hamid Ali that all, many of you saw yesterday, and, and uh, he's certainly my greatest teacher, although I've never met him and never seen him live, but uh, I've been much informed by his teachings. <clears throat> the subject I'm addressing this morning is um, illness and what creates illness. And as a Western team medical doctor, uh, I was programmed really to see illness as a separate category distinct from health and to see it on see it in purely physical terms so if somebody gets cancer somebody gets rheumatoid arthritis multiple sclerosis ALS Crohn's disease chronic fatigue fibromyalgia chronic asthma chronic psoriasis whatever it is that's just a physical event in the body with no relationship to our emotions and furthermore the individual illness in a person is seen as separate from that person's life in a certain environment. So we separate the mind from the body in Western medicine, and we separate the individual from the environment. Now, <clears throat> what's wrong with that, quite apart from the fact that it's not valid, it's also not even scientific in today's um, scientific uh, sense, in that the research that shows that these separations are invalid has been done and published and it gets deeper and more proliferates more regularly and yet the insights of the science do not penetrate medical practice. The Buddha 2500 years ago said it best as he said many things best. He talked about what he called the interconnected core rising of phenomena and basically he said that nothing exists on its own. He said when you look at a leaf or a raindrop, meditate on the conditions near and distant that contributed to the presence of that leaf or raindrop. Know that the world, you know, and obviously in the leaf or in the raindrop, there's the sky, there's the uh, irrigation from the, from the clouds, there's the sun, without the life of which there could be no life, there's the earth, the minerals, the nutrition that goes into making that leaf. So he said, when you look at the leaf, you see the whole world. And he says, um, this is because that is, that is not because this is not, this is born because that is born, this dies, and because that dies, the birth and death of any phenomenon are connected to the birth and death of all other phenomenon. The one contains the many, the many contains the one. Now, in modern scientific terms, that could be called a biopsychosocial approach. And to, to give it its full name, it really might be called a biopsychospiritual approach. And what does that mean? It means really according to the North American native medicine wheel, human beings have their spiritual, physical, emotional, and intellectual uh, dimensions. And by separating these from another, we can't understand what happens to human beings. So let me give you three examples uh, in terms of health of what might be termed the biopsychosocial approach. So we know, for example, from multiple studies that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. So in polluted areas where there is significant irritation of the airways, where asthma is more common, it is the children whose parents are most stressed 
who are most likely to have asthma. And you say, well, what's the connection between the parent's stress and the child's lung functioning? And the, uh, the connection is actually straightforward and physiologically utterly simple. But it's highly unusual for anybody to go to the doctor with uh, asthma and be asked anything about their childhoods or their relationship with their parents or how they relate to themselves. Now, how do we treat asthma? We treat it with basically two medications combined in an inhaler or separate inhalers, or we inject them into people if they're severely asthmatic. And one medication is designed to open up the narrowed airways, the other is to suppress the inflammation of the airways. Now, the medication that opens up the airway, the bronchodilator, is actually a copy of adrenaline or it's adrenaline directly. The medication that suppresses the inflammation or which, um, which is either a copy of uh, cortisol or is cortisol directly. In other words, we're giving cortisol and adrenaline in to make the child's lung function normally. Now, what are adrenaline and cortisol? Does anybody here know what they are? They're the stress hormones. So they're the hormones manufactured by our adrenal gland adrenal, renal kidney, adrenal, top of the kidney. The adrenal gland makes two, and I know I'm speaking fast because I only got 40 minutes, so I have a lot to tell you. But I, I hope I'm getting across here. The adrenal gland makes two hormones. One is named after it, adrenaline. And the adrenal gland, like the brain, is a cortex. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree. So that makes a hormone named after it called cortisol. Adrenaline, if you're threatened and stressed, will increase your heart rate, send more oxygen to your brain and your muscles, make your muscles stronger so you can fight and escape. Cortisol will elevate your blood sugar so you have more energy for the fight or flight response. That's the stress response. In the short term, that's what they do. What's the connection? The connection is that when parents are stressed, kids are stressed because the emotional stresses of the parents invariably and inevitably affect the child. And there's a quote from Almas that illustrates that very beautifully. And he says, the infant, the child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the tension and rigidity and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. The organism does not develop the confidence that it can regulate itself, that things will happen the way they should. So, when parents are chronically stressed, so are children, especially very sensitive children, and that means that their adrenal gland is working overtime. They're releasing cortisol and adrenaline higher than normal or healthy quantities. Their adrenal system gets exhausted, and now we have to give them extra stress hormones to keep their lungs open and uninflamed. Biopsychosocial, the psychological and social relationships with the parents program the biology of the child. And of course, if you ask why are the parents stressed, well, that's a social thing. Parents are stressed because of economic insecurity, because of war, racism, or because of issues unresolved from their own childhoods. But any number of things can stress the parents, which then have an effect on the child. Now, Another example of what may be called a biopsychosocial perspective, in other words, illustrating the utter impossibility, invalidity of separating mind from body and the individual from the environment. Women with breast lumps, 500 in a study in Australia, they were biopsied because they had a lump that was suspicious for malignancy. Before the results came back, the women underwent a psychological interview when the results were collated, it turns out that if a woman was emotionally isolated, that by itself did not increase the chance of the lump being cancerous. Similarly, if a woman was stressed, that has zero effect on whether the lump was cancerous or not. But if a woman was emotionally isolated and stressed, the risk of that lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. Now, the researchers, being Western trained scientists and medical doctors, couldn't figure this one out. Because they said, how does zero and zero add up to nine? But if you understand the biopsychosocial nature of human beings, it's straight obvious. Because here's the thing. If you're stressed, <clears throat> experience some upset or, th or threat, your, your adrenaline and cortisol levels are going to be high in order to help you deal with the stress. In the short term, that's positive. 
But let me read you a quote from a, an article published in the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. This journal was, uh, this article was published, it's from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, and this article was published two years ago, and if only the medical profession understood the implications of this article in a major medical journal, medical practice would be totally different. And here's what they say. Addressing trauma is not just about healing past wounds, it's about transforming our lives and relationships. Dr. Gabor Maté's approach offers a compassionate and comprehensive way to understand and address these deep-seated issues. Dr. Gabor Maté's insights into how early childhood experiences shape our emotional health are profound. One way to build on this understanding is to look at how these early experiences also influence our stress responses as adults. For instance, a child who grows up in a high-stress environment may develop a heightened fight-or-flight response which can affect their ability to handle stress later in life. This can manifest in chronic anxiety or difficulty managing emotions. Understanding this connection can help us develop more effective stress management techniques tailored to our unique histories. An example of this is seen in children who experience parental divorce. Studies have shown that these children often develop heightened stress responses that persist into adulthood. This can manifest in chronic anxiety or difficulty forming stable relationships. Growing, growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the adaptations that a child makes to endure stress in the short term help him survive and in the long term make him sick. Now, if you look at how that works in terms of the stress hormones, they have their value in the acute threat situation, flight or fight. In the long term, what does the development do? It elevates the blood pressure. It narrows your blood vessels, it increases the risk, it makes you nervous, anxious, and it increases the risk of heart disease and strokes. Short-term adaptation, long-term illness. Cortisol in the short term gives you more sugar so you can fight back or escape. In the long term, it thins your bones so you get osteoporosis, makes you depressed, puts fats on your belly so that your risk of heart disease goes up, ulcerates your intestines, and suppresses your immune system. Now let's go back to that Australian study Let's say you have a woman who's stressed. Something happened. Somebody hurt her, or she lost a job, or something occurred. But she's not emotionally isolated. So she's sitting there upset and stressed, and her hormone levels are high. But somebody, a friend, a, a trusted companion, comes over and says, Hey, I see that you're upset. Do you want to talk about it? What happens to her physiology in a split second? The stress levels abate, the body changes in a minute, the heart rate goes down, she takes a deeper breath, gets more oxygen, the cortisol levels go down. But the woman who's stressed and isolated remains under siege by her stress hormones for a long time, including the suppression of the immune system. No wonder then that the women who are isolated and stressed are more likely to have a malignant transformation in that lump, which is to say that cancer is not the disease of the individual. Cancer in a person reflects a whole set of psychological and social relationships throughout the lifetime. It's only the end point of something that's been going on for a long, long time. And as somebody very astutely said, trying to, and, and this is why we're not finding the cure for cancer, because we're not looking where we need to. And as somebody very astutely said, uh, a British researcher, he said that, um, Thanks. He said that trying to find the cause of cancer by studying the individual cell is like trying to understand the traffic jam by studying the internal combustion engine. <clears throat> now, one, one more example. One more example. At the end of life, we know that couples have been together for a long time. One of them is hospitalized. The other one has a significant risk of dying. And the British study just three weeks ago showed that when um, in, an elderly person is bereaved, their partner dies, 
you can find measurable deleterious changes in the hormonal apparatus and the immune systems. In other words, the immune system, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system of the one is modulated by the psychological relationship. So, in understanding illness then, we have to look at this mind-body unity and we have to look at the relationship of that individual to their psychological social environment. So, in, um, in my years of family practice, and then for seven years, I was medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, which is to say, we looked after terminally ill people. <clears throat> I found that who got sick and who didn't was at all, not at all accidental. That, that there were certain patterns that I inevitably I had to be aware of. And all the people that got sick with chronic illness, whether that be, again, cancer, autoimmune disease, neurological disorders like ALS, MS, Parkinson's, and so on. What these patterns were, and I'm telling you, which may sound dogmatic, but I've been at the game long enough to be convinced of this, that there are no exceptions. I'm going to read you some newspaper clippings that illustrate who is illness prone, and I'll, then I'll tell you why. The first is an article, these are all articles from the Global Mail newspaper, which is Canada's national paper, and I wrote a medical column for them for a couple of years. <clears throat> it's by a woman. The first article is by a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna. Her doctor's name is Harold, and her husband is called Hi. And Hi's first wife died of breast cancer, and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And Donna writes in his first-person account of her visit to the doctor's office. Harold tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hai, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice? She's the one diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness, will have to go through chemo, radiation, possibly surgery. And her first thought is, how will I support my husband emotionally? So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for disease. Major risk factor. The others that I will read you are actually obituaries from the same newspaper, and obituaries are fascinating because they tell us not just about the person who died, but also about what we value in one another unwittingly. And what we value in one another is exactly what kills us. You've heard the, ex you've heard the expression, the good die young. Half of you are breathing easily right now and you're not worried. <laughs> so this obituary is uh, about a physician who died age 55 of cancer. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on, his, he carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So what would you say to a friend of yours diagnosed with cancer? Go back to work tomorrow, and all the while that you're getting treatment, ignore that, ignore your needs, don't think at all about your life, and just keep working until you drop. So this automatic and rigid identification with duty, role and responsibility rather than the needs of the self is the second major risk factor for chronic illness. The next one is written by a husband who is writing this with gratitude about his wife who died age 55 of breast cancer. In her entire life she never got into a fight with anyone. The word she could say was fui or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. Now I'm sure that, like me, many of you have partners, spouses, sometimes you wish that they would blend in with the environment. <laughs> in an unassuming manner. But they won't do that if they want to stay healthy. Because the suppression of the so-called negative emotions, particularly anger, actually suppresses the immune system. And finally, this obituary, which is almost beyond belief, but it's real. This is a physician who died age 72 of cancer. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, 
a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife Rosalind and their four young kids waited for him at home. Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy, until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. <laughs> this man suffered from two fatal beliefs. One is that he's responsible for how the people feel, and secondly, that he must never disappoint anybody. So there's four, these four factors, this automatic concern for the emotional needs of others, ignoring your own, compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the authentic self, um, suppression of so-called negative emotions, repression of them, and finally, the belief that you're responsible for what other people feel and that you must never, never disappoint anybody, so you never say no. These are the significant risk factors that are present in cases of chronic illness, and they're quite capable of killing you for reasons I'll explain shortly. But before I do, let's explain why people behave in these ways. Are we blaming the patient for the disease? We're not blaming the patient for the disease because these are not deliberate, consciously chosen patterns. Remember that Harvard article I quoted to you? Adaptations that help you survive the immediate uh, stress in childhood become source of pathology later on. These are all adaptations. Nobody chooses to believe, behave in these ways. And I can give you a personal example. So I, I'm, when I was 54 or so, I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on one of my knees. I had a bit of a tear in a cartilage. So that afternoon, I had a bit of a limp. And I'm visiting my mother, who there's a genetic disease in our family called muscular dystrophy, which means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. But by the way, most diseases are not like that, and there are very few diseases genetically determined. Uh, even in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is a breast cancer gene, or, or several breast cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. The gene is not the major cause of breast cancer. Muscular dystrophy, yes, if you have the gene, rare, but you're likely to have the disease. So my mother had it, so at age 78, she could no longer get out of bed, she could barely feed herself. Mentally, she was very strong. Recognizing these patterns in our behavior allows us to approach our healing journey with greater empathy and patience for ourselves. It also empowers us to seek out specific therapies and practices that address these deep-seated responses. For example, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, can be a valuable tool in helping individuals become more aware of their stress triggers and develop healthier responses. Additionally, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, can assist in identifying and changing negative thought patterns that contribute to stress and anxiety. Dr. Gabor Matei's insights remind us that our childhood experiences leave lasting imprints on our emotional and psychological health. Recognizing these imprints allows us to take a compassionate approach towards ourselves and others, acknowledging that our reactions and behaviors are often shaped by past traumas. And how does it become a source of physical pathology? Well, because we have another need. We have the need for attachment, that's clear. But we have another need, and that is need for authenticity. Authenticity is a sense of being ourselves, and knowing who we are and what we feel. No, that's not a, a new age, abstract, psychological, spiritual uh, woo-hoo need. It's actually a survival need. Because to be authentic is to be in touch with your body and your gut feelings. And in the long period of evolutionary development, living in a state of nature amidst all kinds of nature, uh, dangers, how long exactly would a human being survive if they were not in touch with their gut feelings? They wouldn't. So that the, the, the authenticity is as, as, as powerful as the attachment need in the long term. But what happens to a child where the authenticity threatens attachment? And what do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, as a one and a half year old, two year old, um, your child is angry at you. And by the way, if you have a one and a half and two year old and they're never angry with you, you're not doing your job. Because they can't have five cookies before dinner and they can't climb on the table to play with a shiny knife. So they're going to get frustrated, so they're going to throw a tantrum, which is what they do. 
But how if, what about if you grow up in a home where there was a rageaholic father and the very hint of anger threatens you unconsciously? So you give the message to the child that good little kids don't get angry. In other words, good little, little kids who get angry are not good, they're not acceptable to the parent. Well, guess what? If that message is driven home powerfully enough, the child would repress the anger in order to maintain the attachment relationship. Pure adaptation. But in the long term, that repression of the authentic self, as in the cases I mentioned, is what leads to disease. So this is the please love me syndrome. Love me at any cost. The child, when it comes to attachment versus authenticity, has absolutely no choice in the matter. Because without attachment, they can't survive. Treat me like a fool, treat me mean and cool, but love me. That's not love. Just let me stay attached to you at any cost. Now the problem is that once you make the choice, although it's no choice at all, to go for attachment, then we spend the rest of our lives living that out. And we spend the rest of our lives suppressing our authenticity. Now, how does that lead to illness? Well, it leads to illness for the very simple reason as you can't separate the mind from the body. And we now know scientifically that there's no basis for those separations. So it's not that there's a nervous system and an immune system and a hormonal apparatus and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system. It's all part and parcel of the same system. So there's a science that's I would say it's new, but it's only relatively new. It's been around for a few decades now. It's called psychoneuro psychoneuroimmunology that studies the connections and the unity of the emotional system, the immune system, the hormonal apparatus, and the nervous system. It turns out there aren't separate systems, it's just one. To say that they're even connected is, is kind of false because you, you connect two things that are discrete, but these are not discrete systems. They're just the differentiated functioning of the same super system. So it turns out that the nervous system wires them all together like a giant electrical grid. It connects the bone marrow to the brain. It sends messages from the bone marrow to the brain, from the brain to the bone marrow, where our immune and red cells are manufactured, from the thymus gland in the neck, where the white cells are stored, to the brain and vice versa, the gut to the brain, the heart to the brain, brain to the heart. The heart itself is a nervous system. It's like a second brain in a sense. It has certain predictive capacities, especially for negative things. We say, I knew in my heart, you did. And that's connected to the brain up here. Then they all secrete messenger substances into the circulation and they talk to one another biochemically so that the, um, the immune cells, the white cells in your circulation have um, the capacity to manufacture every hormone that the brain manufactures. And so the immune system is talking to the brain, and the brain is talking to the immune system. The immune system has been called a floating brain. It's got learning capacity, reactive capacity, and memory, just like the brain does. Then there's the gut-brain connection. I'm going to ask you this question and ask for a show of hands, please. If you've had the following experience, please put your hand up, that you've had a powerful gut feeling about something, you ignored it, and you were sorry afterwards. <laughs> okay. Now, let me ask for the obverse. Those of you that have a powerful gut feeling, you ignored it, and you're grateful afterwards, put your hand up. Now, you see how much more the, the majority has it, is with the gut. Now, I would even argue, had I had time, with those of you that just put your hand up, that what you had was not a gut feeling at all, it was just a strong emotion. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. But there's a difference. You know, the gut feeling um, is there's something calm and knowing about it. There's no agitation about it. But nevertheless, even if I take your word for it, it's still like, you know, 30 to 1. So why is the gut so much more intelligent than your thoughts? In other words, when you went with your thoughts, you were wrong. If you pay attention to your gut feelings, you're right. Well, the gut sends many more messages to the brain than come the other way. If you've ever been treated for depression, like I have with, say, Prozac, which elevates serotonin levels, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does, the mood chemical. 
the God receives messages from the whole brain and it magnifies them and sends them back up so that when you are listening to gut feelings you're getting the whole picture your intellect your thoughts are only a very small part of your uh, of your um, evaluative apparatus and emotions came much before we had thoughts necessarily because without strong gut feelings again we just didn't survive now There's a group of people called aphasiacs who can't process words because they had a stroke in that part of the brain. Aphasiacs have been shown in a number of studies to be much more astute at knowing when somebody's a liar than people who understand language. Why do you suppose that is? Because they take in the whole picture, the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expression, the congruence of body language, tone, and facial expression. And that's a much more significant markers of truth than the words are. If, if, if aphasiacs voted, no politician would ever get elected. <laughs> but there's another large group of people, but there's another large group of people who, I mean, if you look, you know, and, and that may seem like sort of a, a knock on politicians, but let me tell you, um, it was a very interesting phenomenon with, with President George, George Bush Jr. If you ever, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but if you ever turned off the sound on the television and he was speaking, what would you observe? A very nervous and scared little kid. And this guy was the most powerful man in the world, so they say. A scared little kid. Now, there's another large group of human beings who are perfectly capable of unerringly reading and reacting to the gut feelings. And what do we call those people? What do we call them? Children. We call them babies. Okay, no one day old baby is disconnected from the gut feelings. When you put your hand up and I ask you, how many of you had the experience of ignoring and then regretting, not having paid attention to gut feelings, you were telling me the story of your childhood. The story of your childhood was that when you, you were born pristine and authentic, completely in touch with yourself, and then you learned that in order to stay attached to your environment, you had to suppress that part of yourself. So, that, so, the, so the suppression itself became associated with survival. No wonder you're afraid to be authentic. Because there's something in you that says, if I'm authentic, I won't be loved anymore, and if I'm not loved, I won't survive. Then we keep choosing attachment over authenticity, and then we get sick. And then we get sick. Dr. Gaber Mate emphasizes the importance of compassion in the healing process. Adding to this, it's crucial to understand that compassion not only helps us heal emotionally, but also has tangible benefits for our physical health. Research shows that self-compassion practices can reduce levels of the stress hormone cortisol and increase heart rate variability, which is an indicator of a healthy stress response. By practicing self-compassion, we can improve our overall health and well-being, making it a powerful tool in our healing arsenal. Integrating self-compassion into daily routines, such as through mindfulness or gentle self-talk, can create a nurturing environment for healing. This small shift can have a profound impact on our mental and physical health. Moreover, engaging in self-compassion exercises, such as writing a letter to oneself from the perspective of a compassionate friend, can foster a deeper sense of self-acceptance and emotional resilience. These practices not only alleviate stress, but also promote a more balanced and fulfilling life. A practical exercise to enhance self-compassion is the self-compassion break. When you encounter a difficult situation, take a moment to acknowledge your suffering, remind yourself that suffering is a part of the human experience, and offer yourself words of kindness and support. Let me give you an example. Um, I just need um, a volunteer, okay? So I mentioned that the suppression of anger suppresses the immune system. So you're going to volunteer. Thanks. No, you need to stay where you are. What's your name? Judith. Judith, okay. So uh, there's one, one rule here, only Judith, okay? Which is that the chair that you're sitting in is your life, so you can't leave it, okay? For this experiment. After the talk, you can leave, or, you, or even... <laughs> or even before the talk, but not for this experiment, okay? So the question I'm going to ask you is, are you okay with the distance between you and I right now? If I spoke from here for the rest of the morning, is that okay with you? Yeah. 
Okay, now I'm going to stand here and ask you the same question. Is it still okay with you? If I lecture from here, how about right now? Yeah. Is it still okay with you? Okay, what about right now? It's getting a little tight. <laughs> it's getting a little tight? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's still okay. It's still okay. All right, I'm going to put a knee on your knee, you know? <laughs> How's that now? It feels good. I'm going to stand on your knee in a minute. No, you're not. You know, okay. okay. How, would the, how would that feel to you? I wouldn't like you it. You wouldn't like it. What would you do about it? I'd have to push you off. Okay, right. And as you were pushing, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Fear and anger. Anger. The fear would come first. Yes. And then the anger. Yes. So in other words, the anger is not a negative emotion. It's a healthy boundary defense. Anger, healthy anger simply says, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. There's unhealthy anger, but that's different. Healthy anger says, you're in my space. Healthy anger is in the present. It's not about the past and the future. It's just, it's a boundary defense, you're in my space, get out. That's it. Now, if you look at the role of emotions in general, what is their job? Now, in another situation with another person, you actually might invite them closer. Perhaps. You know, some people in your life, in some situations, you would invite closer. So the role of emotions is to tell you what you want more of and being closer to you, allow in to your space and to keep out the unwelcome and the potentially dangerous. That's all the emotion. Invite in the nourishing, the healthy, the welcome, keep out the dangerous, threatening, unwelcome. What is the role of the immune system? It's exactly the same thing. The immune system and the emotional system do exactly the same thing. Because of the unity that I've mentioned to you, when you suppress the one, you're suppressing the other. And that's why the repression of healthy anger is a significant risk factor for, for cancer, because the immune system is suppressed. Now, on the other hand, what else can happen? If, let's say you repress anger. You're one of these really nice people, and you're always helping people. You never say no. And the book of mine that this talk is based on is entitled, When the Body Says No. My contention being is if you don't, the body will say it for you. I may have said that before. So, what happens to anger that you don't express? Does it evaporate, go away, fly to the moon? Where does it turn? It turns against you in a form of depression. What does the word depression mean? It means to push something down. It's that simple. It was an adaptation. Depression begins as an adaptation. You have to push down your feelings to stay attached. 30 years later, you're taking Prozac. And they tell you, you got this genetic disease. Nonsense. In the same way that the anger can turn against you in the form of depression or self-loathing, self-blame, in the same way, the immune system can turn against you so that the immune cells and um, immune organs that are meant to <clears throat> defend you will not attack you. And that's autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, Crohn's, colitis, fibromyalgia, in multiple sclerosis. So, I'm going to bring this to a close, and I'm sorry I will not have time for questions, but I'm happy to hang on afterwards um, and talk to people. I'm going to close with a quote from my honored teacher, Alma, sorry, Hamid Ali, who says, the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support. He's talking about childhood. The greater calamity, which was caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your essence. That is much more important than whether your mother or father loved you or not. Well, that's the good news. Because if the problem was that you were not loved, supported, recognized, honored, or if you were abused 15, 30, 50 years ago, if that was the problem, we're stuck because we can't undo the past. But if the problem was that as a result of those events, we disconnected from ourselves in order to maintain, to stay attached, our cells, our essence is still here and we can reconnect. We can reconnect. So that's the good news. And in that sense, although we tend to look upon symptoms and illness as enemies to get rid of, we talk about the war on cancer, the battle against cancer, we can look up at it totally differently. Yeah, receive what medical treatment makes sense to you. I'm not, I'm a physician, I'm not against medical treatment or medical advancement. But, also ask the question, what is my body saying no to that I didn't say no to? 
What is the meaning of this relapse of my rheumatoid arthritis? What stresses did I impose on myself? Where didn't I say no? And then the illness can actually become your teacher. Your teacher towards what? Towards authenticity. And let me ask you this final question. How many of you know people who have recovered from addiction or some serious illness, and some people even who don't recover from a serious illness, but will still say, and I've heard this many times, I'll still say, that addiction, that illness was the best thing that ever happened to me. How many of you heard such statements? Many of you have. I certainly have in my career as a physician. What are people talking about? They're talking about that the illness forced me to become authentic. It gave me back myself, which is what Almas calls the precious pearl. Dr. Gabor Mate discusses the importance of recognizing our childhood experiences. Building on this, it's important to consider how these early experiences influence our attachment styles. For example, someone with an insecure attachment style may struggle with trust and intimacy in relationships. By identifying these patterns, we can work towards developing healthier relationships. Studies have shown that individuals with secure attachment styles tend to have healthier and more satisfying relationships. For instance, adults who experienced consistent and nurturing care in childhood are more likely to develop trust and intimacy in their relationships compared to those with insecure attachment histories. Therapies like attachment-based therapy or engaging in activities that promote secure attachments, such as open and honest communication with loved ones, can be incredibly beneficial. Understanding and addressing our attachment styles can lead to more fulfilling and supportive relationships. It's a crucial step in breaking free from past patterns and building a healthier future. Additionally, practicing emotional intelligence skills, such as recognizing and managing our emotions, can enhance our ability to form and maintain healthy relationships. Attending workshops or support groups focused on relationship skills can provide valuable insights and practical tools for improving our interpersonal connections. One practical tip is to practice active listening in your relationships. This means fully engaging with the other person, paying attention to their words, and responding thoughtfully. This practice can help build trust and strengthen your connections. Reflecting on our attachment styles allows us to understand our relationship dynamics better. It empowers us to make conscious choices in our interactions, fostering healthier and more supportive connections with others. People with severe addictions um, to cocaine, to crystal meth, to, to opiates like heroin, uh, to uh, alcohol, of course, people dying of HIV, of hepatitis C, and every other disease caused by addictions. And in my practice, I looked after young families, I looked after people of all ages, and I'll tell you, what I've learned, the one thing I've learned, I've learned many things, but the one thing that I can reduce it to or simplify it to is that virtually everything I ever saw, whether it was cancer, whether it was multiple sclerosis, whether it was depression, whether it was addiction, whether it was ADHD, whether it was colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know what it came down to? It came down to what happens in people's childhoods. In other words, the major contributor, I don't say the only, but the major contributing factor to the onset of illness, whether it's mental illness, physical illness, whether it's addiction, whether it's behavior problems, it what happens to people in the first few years of life. And that may seem like an astonishing statement, and how is this guy going to prove it in the 16 minutes that he's got left? Well, let's give it a try. In the downtown east side, which is Vancouver's drug area, and not only is it Vancouver's drug area, it's also known as North America's most concentrated area of drug use. We have more people there using, uh, injecting substances than any other place in North America in a few square block radius. I can tell you, that over a 12-year period, I didn't meet a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child, not a single male patient who had not been either physically abused or sexually abused or neglected or abandoned in significant ways. And 
In North America, we like to think of addiction as either a choice that people make, and if they make that choice, then we punish them for it, so we build jails where we keep people who use drugs. Or we see it as a brain disease that's genetically inherited. So if we look at the, the sad fact that in Canada, 30% of the people in our jails are First Nations origin, where they only make up 4 to 5% of the population. We explain that by saying that these, these poor people genetically are susceptible to addiction. So it's either we make it into a disease or we make it into a choice. Neither is true. It's not a choice. Nobody ever chooses to be an addict, nor is it something that's inherited. We know, for example, that even people that do inherit some genes that are predisposed to addictions, if they're brought up in proper environments, they have no more risk of addiction than anybody else. So it's not ever the genes that cause the addictions, and nobody ever chooses the addiction. What actually happens is, when people are traumatized, that increases their risk of addiction. And if you want to know why the First Nations population in this country, it's because they're the most traumatized segment in the Canadian population. Historically, I don't suppose I have to tell you about that, but the fact that in the Prairie Provinces, I'm not sure what the percentage are in Alberta, but I know in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, I know the percentage is high, I don't know how high it is in, in, in Alberta, but most of the kids in care are First Nations origin. This is in a population that knew how to look after their kids beautifully, that if you look at the parenting practices of First Nations people across the world, they're actually superior to those of industrial societies according to all the research unless they're traumatized. Dr. Gabor Mate explains how unresolved trauma can lead to physical symptoms. Expanding on this, it's valuable to explore specific ways in which trauma manifests in the body, such as chronic pain or gastrointestinal issues. Practices like somatic experiencing, which focuses on bodily sensations to release stored trauma, or engaging in regular physical activities like yoga or tai chi, can help alleviate these physical symptoms. For example, individuals suffering from chronic pain often find relief through somatic experiencing techniques. This therapeutic approach helps them release stored trauma by focusing on bodily sensations and gradually integrating these experiences. These practices work by helping the body process and release the trauma held within it. Incorporating these body-focused therapies into your healing routine can lead to significant improvements in both physical and emotional health providing a holistic approach to trauma recovery. Additionally, exploring complementary therapies such as acupuncture or massage therapy can further support the body's natural healing processes. These therapies can help reduce stress, improve circulation, and promote a sense of well-being, making them valuable components of a comprehensive healing plan. In which case, the trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. So when it comes to addiction then, what we're looking at is the impact of childhood trauma. Why? Because number one, if you, let's just define an addiction. An addiction is any behavior, substance related or not, that an individual pursues because they find pleasure, relief, or um, they crave it temporarily, so they pursue it for the pleasure and the relief despite negative consequences and they don't give it up in the face of negative consequences. I said any behavior. So that could be sex, gambling, eating, shopping, work, relationships, or substances. And if you ask yourself by that definition, have you ever had an addictive pattern in your life? If you're like most of the people I speak with, if I ask that question, many of you would put your hand up by that definition, if you've ever had an addictive behavior. And then if you ask yourself, but what did that behavior give me? What did I like about it? Well, you'll tell yourself, it relieves stress. So when I am very stressed, I go home and I eat a lot. Or uh, then I turn on the TV and I just veg out. Um, or I do drugs. Or I go shopping and I spend a lot of money I, don't, I can't afford to spend. So, in other, in other words, the addiction serves a purpose, it temporarily relieves stress, or it distracts you from emotional pain that you're experiencing, 
or it gives you pleasure that otherwise is not available to you. What I'm saying to you is that the addiction is never the primary problem. The addiction is always an attempt on the individual's part to solve a problem. The problem is why I'm having so much emotional pain and how come I don't know how to deal with emotional pain? Why is there so much stress in my life and how is it that I can't regulate my stresses without an addictive expression? Why am I lacking pleasure? If you're feeling shy and isolated and it takes a few drinks to loosen your tongue, what happened to you that you feel so scared of people? In other words, the addiction is not the problem, the addiction is actually an attempt at a solution. The problem arose because early in childhood you were somehow hurt. Because when people are traumatized, a number of things happen. One is, they begin to feel themselves as deficient, because children are narcissistic. And I don't mean that in the sense of any pejorative uh, implication. What I mean by that is, they think it's all about them. <clears throat> they think everything is about themselves. So when good things happen to a child, the child will assume, hey, I must be great, because look at all these great things that are happening. But if bad things happen to a child, if the child is yelled at, or beaten, or sexually abused, or told to go to their room, when their parents don't like their behavior, or the parents are just depressed or unhappy or stressed, traumatized in their own life, the child thinks these bad things are happening because I'm a bad person. So then you have low self-esteem. Dr. Gaber Mate's teachings remind us that our bodies often hold on to trauma, manifesting as physical ailments. By addressing the root causes and incorporating body-focused therapies, we can facilitate holistic healing and improve our overall quality of life. Engage in regular physical activities that promote body awareness and relaxation. Activities like yoga, tai chi, or even mindful walking can help you connect with your body and release stored tension. Building a supportive community is crucial for recovery, as Dr. Gabor Mate highlights. To add to this, it's important to actively seek out and engage with communities that resonate with your healing journey. This could involve joining support groups, finding online communities, or participating in local workshops and events focused on trauma and healing. These connections provide not only emotional support, but also practical advice and shared experiences that can facilitate your healing process. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is that what we now know, and this is a conference on the brain, what we now know is that the circuits of the brain are actually shaped by early experiences, so that the brain isn't just genetically determined, that already in the uterus, what's happening to the mother is already affecting the brain circuitry of the child. So when the mother is stressed, that's affecting the baby's brain. And these people that are traumatized in childhood, they don't have the conditions for healthy brain development. And then they're going to have mental health problems. And they're going to have ways of, of, of compensating for those mental health problems through addictive behaviors. So whether we're looking at the low self-esteem, whether we're looking at the brain physiology, whether we're looking at the spiritual isolation of how alone the addict feels, it all goes back to what happened early in childhood. It's just a compensation. It's not a healthy compensation. It creates more problems. But where did it begin? It began with suffering of the young child. Now, as I said, everything I've seen, whether it was cancer, multiple sclerosis, or mental illness, or addiction, begins with childhood issues. Well, how can cancer begin with childhood issues, you ask yourself? A Canadian study showed that when children are abused, when they grow up to be adults, the risk of cancer goes up nearly 50%. Why? Because the abuse or the trauma creates coping mechanisms. Now, one of the ways that we cope when children are traumatized, one of the ways they, they cope with it is to soothe themselves, and then that's where addictions come in. But another way to cope would be is if you get the message that you're not good enough, that you are not worthy enough, then you might spend the rest of your life trying to prove that you are. And how do you do that? By being very nice to everybody. By never saying how you feel, because they might not like how you feel. 
by never expressing healthy anger when somebody's crossing your boundaries, by working too hard to prove that you're worthwhile. That's why I was a workaholic doctor, because I got the message as an infant, as a Jewish infant under the Nazis in the Second World War. I got the message that the world didn't want me, I wasn't good enough. Well, then you spend the rest of your life compensating by taking on too much and you're stressing yourself. And those stresses have an impact on your physiology. They have an impact on your immune system. They have an impact on your cardiovascular system, on your heart, on your nervous system. They can cause disease. So most diseases that most of my colleagues, the physicians, think they're just random arbitrary diseases, they're not random or arbitrary at all. They're the result of life strong stresses that result from a child's attempt to compensate. So typically people with autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or colitis or Crohn's disease or for that matter cancer, if you look at their lives what you notice about them is they've had great difficulty expressing their emotions because in childhood they were forbidden from doing so. So they compensated by suppressing their feelings and they have great difficulty saying no so that when people ask them to do things they automatically will say yes and they'll keep doing things even though they f they're very stressed by it. And then you end up with the body saying no because they didn't in the form of illness. I know this is I'm not telling you proof because this too, my time with you tonight is too short, but what I do, can tell you th that is absolutely scientifically unquestionable is that you cannot separate the mind from the body. So whatever happens emotionally will actually have an impact on your physiology because the brain systems that regulate emotions are part and parcel of the same system that the immune system is a part of, the cardiovascular system is a part of, the nervous system is a part of, and the hormonal apparatus is all one, part of it as well. So whatever happens emotionally also immediately has an impact physiologically. And that's why you can't separate people's emotional lives from their physiology. You can also not separate people's physiology from their relationships. We know, for example, that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. Many people find solace and support in joining local or online support groups. These communities provide a safe space to share experiences, receive feedback, and learn from others who are on similar healing journeys. Um, actively engaging with a supportive community can provide the encouragement and accountability needed to sustain your healing efforts. It also reminds you that you are not alone in this journey. Additionally, volunteering or participating in community service can foster a sense of connection and purpose, further enhancing your emotional well-being. Building strong social networks through regular interaction and mutual support can significantly improve the quality of your life and contribute to your overall healing process. Building a supportive community is about more than just having people around you. It's about creating meaningful connections that nurture your growth and well-being. This sense of belonging can significantly enhance your resilience and capacity to heal. Take the initiative to reach out and engage with communities that resonate with your healing journey. Whether it's through online forums, local meetups, or therapeutic workshops, actively participating in these communities can provide a robust support system. Dr. Gabor Mate shares insights on integrating these practices into daily life. One practical approach is to establish a daily routine that incorporates both emotional and physical self-care practices. For instance, starting your day with a mindfulness meditation, followed by journaling about your feelings, and ending with a physical activity like a walk or yoga session can create a balanced approach to healing. These routines help reinforce the principles Dr. Gabor Mate discusses and make them a regular part of your life. Create a daily self-care routine that incorporates both emotional and physical practices. Start small, such as spending five minutes in meditation each morning, and gradually increase the duration and variety of your practices as they become ingrained in your routine. 
Integrating these practices into daily life requires commitment and consistency. However, the rewards are substantial as these practices not only enhance your immediate well-being, but also contribute to long-term emotional and physical health. Consider the experiences of individuals who have incorporated mindfulness practices into their daily routines. Many report feeling more grounded, less anxious, and more capable of handling life's challenges. These practices have proven benefits in improving both mental and physical health. Self-compassion involves treating yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you would offer to a friend. This shift in perspective can be transformative fostering a more positive relationship with yourself and reducing the harsh self-criticism that often accompanies trauma. And so that the more stressed and depressed the parents are, the more medication a child might need for their asthma. And why? Because the child's emotions have an impact on the child's physiology and a parent's emotional states have an impact on the child's emotions. And if you want to look at it more broadly, what are we talking about? If you're looking at the increasing rate of asthma in North America these days, and allergies of all kinds, or the increasing rate of ADHD and depression and all that amongst kids, what's going on? What's going on is that the parents are getting more stressed, and therefore the kids are getting more stressed, and therefore the kids are getting more sick. And it's not a question of the parents not loving their kids. It's not a question of blaming parents. It's not a question of parents not doing their best. It's a question is that because of economic circumstances and greater isolation, the breakdown of extended families, the breakdown of communities, all the uncertainties of modern industrial life, the parents are more stressed. And the more stressed the parents are, the more stressed the kids are. And when the kids are emotionally stressed, that also affects their physiology. Isolation. At the end of life, a number of studies have shown now that when people are uh, emotionally isolated, they're more likely to get sick, and if they get sick, they're more likely to die. And so, for example, amongst elderly couples, when one of them is hospitalized, the other's risk for dying goes up significantly. Why? Because our physiology cannot be separated from our emotions, and our emotions cannot be separated from our relationships. So human relationships are actually necessary to, to maintain healthy human life. We're social creatures. It also means that in a society where kids are growing up increasingly without their parents, because their parents are too busy working, they have to, and where children are more and more uh, without that support of the clan and the extended family and the community, you're going to get more people growing up in isolation. And then we try and compensate for that with our cell phones and our internet, which doesn't really do it for us, because for real intimacy, for real contact, you need human connections, not mechanical connections. And so what we're seeing is a whole set of dynamics that leave children more hurt and more isolated. As a result, there are many more problems that they try and compensate for through all kinds of behaviors. And the behaviors that lead to physical illness, like trying to be super nice and trying always to suppress yourself and taking on too much stress, and, the, and or the behaviors that try to compensate by soothing yourself through addictions, they all come down to what happened earlier in life. And I'm just writing an article right now for the Toronto Star on the recent election. And let me finish with just one final comment. I don't care what you think about Stephen Harper's policies. This is not a political talk. But one thing I can tell you is that so many people felt uncomfortable with him on the emotional level. Why did they feel uncomfortable with him? Because they looked into his eyes, and what did they see? They saw nothing. And people talked about his dead eyes. Now, you know what that tells me? That he was a traumatized person. Because a child's eyes go dead 
when what they're seeing is too painful. And emotionally, the brain protects the child by shutting down emotionally. And then, when you're hurt emotionally, then one of the ways you compensate is you want to be controlling, and you want to be angry, and you want to be powerful, and you want to close your eyes to human suffering and to human vulnerability, and your eyes go dead. And that's not a deliberate decision. So here's what I'm saying to you. Whether you're looking at politics or health or human behavior, whether you're looking at education, whether you're looking at relationships, because how we program these children shows up in our adult relationships. So when I arrive from a speaking trip, uh, and my wife is not there to pick me up at the airport, and I have this pain and I have this anger, you know what that's about? That's about the fact that my mother abandoned me when I was a year old. Because to save my life, she gave me to a stranger. That's how it was. And that emotional memory of abandonment is still in here, and it shows up with the trivial um, trigger of my wife not being there at the airport to pick me up. So, all this stuff can be worked out, but if I can just summarize everything I've tried to tell you, the first few years are so important. And so if you have children, make those three or four or five early years the most important years of your life to devote them to your children. And if you as an adult are suffering from depression, anxiety, addiction, illness or whatever, go back to your childhood and find out how you were hurt and heal that hurt and then you can heal yourself. Thank you. Dr. Gabor Mate's teachings highlight the importance of addressing trauma with compassion and mindfulness. By understanding our past, practicing self-compassion, and building supportive communities, we can begin the journey towards healing. So, set aside a few minutes each day to write about your experiences and emotions. This practice can provide clarity and insight, helping you to understand and release negative patterns. Over time, Journaling can become a powerful habit that supports your emotional well-being and personal growth. Implementing these practices into your daily routine can transform your life. It's about creating a holistic approach that addresses both your emotional and physical needs. Regularly reflecting on your progress and making adjustments to your healing practices can ensure that you stay on the right path. Remember, healing is a journey, not a destination and being patient and compassionate with yourself is key. Journaling about your feelings can help identify and process unresolved trauma. It's a simple yet powerful tool for self-reflection and healing. In my own journey, I have found journaling to be incredibly transformative. I began journaling daily a few years ago, initially just to track my thoughts and emotions. Over time, this practice evolved into a powerful tool for processing deep-seated traumas and gaining clarity about my inner world. By regularly putting my thoughts on paper, I was able to identify patterns in my emotional responses and understand the underlying causes of my stress and anxiety. One significant breakthrough came when I was struggling with feelings of overwhelming sadness and didn't understand why. Through journaling, I traced these feelings back to unresolved issues from my past that I had never fully addressed. Writing about these experiences allowed me to confront them head on and start the healing process. Moreover, journaling provided a safe space for me to express emotions that I found difficult to talk about with others. It became a therapeutic outlet where I could explore my thoughts without judgment. As I continued this practice, I noticed a gradual improvement in my mental health and emotional resilience. I felt more in tune with my feelings and more capable of managing life's challenges. Journaling also helped me develop greater self-compassion. By reflecting on my experiences and recognizing my progress, I learned to be kinder to myself and appreciate my growth. This simple daily habit has had a profound impact on my overall well-being, and I highly recommend it to anyone looking to deepen their self-awareness and facilitate their healing journey. So I encourage you to start journaling about your feelings. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Even a few minutes each day can make a significant difference. Use this time to explore your inner world, express your emotions, and uncover the insights that will guide you towards healing and self-discovery. 
Set aside a few minutes each day to write about your experiences and emotions. This practice can provide clarity and insight, helping you to understand and release negative patterns. Over time, journaling can become a powerful habit that supports your emotional well-being and personal growth. In our next video, we'll look at practical steps to integrate these healing practices into your daily life. We'll explore specific techniques and strategies to help you build a consistent self-care routine, manage stress effectively, and cultivate a supportive environment. These steps will empower you to take control of your healing journey and achieve lasting change. What part of Dr. Gabor Mate's discussion resonated with you the most? Share your thoughts below and don't forget to like and subscribe. Your feedback is invaluable to us, so please let us know what topics you'd like to see covered in future videos. We are committed to creating content that supports your healing journey and helps you navigate life's challenges with resilience and compassion.